Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we talk with Diane Turco of Cape Downwinders on what it was like to be the accidental recipient of a wayward Nuclear Regulatory Commission email that spilled the beans on how bad the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station at the base of Cape Cod really is. And we also talked with Kristen Iverson, author of the superb book, Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. Kristen explains the preliminary results of the new Rocky Flats Health Survey, which is meant to determine what has happened to the health of those who lived and worked in proximity with that nuclear weapons production site near Denver, Colorado. Plus, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the NRC's nuclear reactor duck and cover report on what's gone wrong this week with those aging dangerous rust buckets, and more honest nuclear information than is likely to be discussed at any of the incoming cabinet meetings taking place in Washington, D.C. after January 20th, 2017. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, December 13, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Starting off in Massachusetts, where this story is so good it deserves to be numbnuts of the week, except for the fact that it's really good for our side. Referencing an article in the Cape Cod Times by the marvelous journalist Christine Legere, in an in-house email sent Monday to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission officials, the leader of a federal inspection team currently scouring equipment, procedures, and staff performance at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station says that inspectors are struggling to interpret just what they are seeing in the troubled plant. Well, they may be looking for a way to spin it, but there is no way to spin this one, guys. The email states that while employees show a lot of positive energy, quote, it appears many staff across the site may not have the standards to know what good actually is. So wrote Donald Jackson, chief of operations at the NRC's Northeast region and team leader. He went on to say, the plant seems overwhelmed just trying to run the station. On Jackson's list of findings to date are failures of plant workers to follow established industry procedures, broken equipment that never gets properly fixed, lack of required expertise among plant experts, failure of some staff to understand their roles and responsibilities, and a team of employees who appear to be struggling with keeping the nuclear plant running. Exelon Corporation, you got some splaining to do. This is the exact kind of information that all of the nuclear industry's spin miters can try to frame as something positive or even benign, and they're not going to get away with it this time because they simply can't. So how the heck did this news, this email, get out? Who let the dogs out? Who let the genie out of that bottle? To find out, I called Diane Turco, co-founder of Cape Downwinders, the group that has been challenging and fighting against this nuclear reactor for decades, who also just happened to be the recipient of this email. Diane Turco, how in the world did you end up getting a copy of that email from the NRC, and what was it like when you discovered that you had it? I was grocery shopping, and I just finished talking with my daughter, and I thought I'd just check my iPhone and uh, see if I had any emails. And so I saw there was something from the NRC, and I just kind of scrolled down quick to see what the next report was. And I noticed it looked more like a conversation. And then I realized it was. And I was like, whoa. So I went back up on the top and saw that my name was in the email to box. And then I scrolled down to the bottom to make sure there was no confidentiality clause. 
and I had a red bar on my phone, and I thought, I've got to get this off my phone immediately. So I just sent it to Christine Legere, our fabulous reporter at the Cape Cod Times, and then my phone died. So I, did, I hadn't even really read it, <laughs> but I sent it to her just to make sure it was in somebody else's hands. Right, getting yourself a protection copy out there, and definitely considering the excellence of Christine's reporting, the superlative nature of her reporting, she was the right person to send it to. What happened from that point? Well, then Christine did a front page over the fold story in the Cape Cod Times, and it just has blown apart what's happening at Pilgrim. You know, when I finally read the report, it was alarming because of the true nature of the voice of Don Jackson, who wrote this. He's an expert investigator uh, with the NRC. And this preliminary uh, report proves that the NRC goal of, quote, arresting declining performance, unquote, is not happening at all. Mr. Jackson also deserves credit for his candor on these documented dangers that the continued operation of Pilgrim presents. Now he needs to lead the way to revoke the operating license. When I read mm -hmm. about this, of course, it was a bombshell going mm -hmm. off. What has been the impact? Has it been covered by the Boston Globe? Has it been covered by broadcast? How wide has the story gotten, and what has been the impact? Oh, well, you know, it has been huge. It's been in the Boston Globe front page over the fold. It's been in all the Boston news stations, TV stations. The New York Times called us yesterday to follow up on this story. I mean, it's huge. This is a game changer. When you read this report, you will be shocked to hear what the NRC observed. And now they cannot go back on these words. They can't whitewash this and stuff it into a box because we have it in black and white from them. If I could share one of those comments. This is what they said, and this is quote, the observation of actual performance, however, is somewhat disjointed. It appears that many staff across the site may not have the standards to know what good actually is. There's a lot of positive energy, but no one seems to know what to do with it to improve performance, leading to procedural noncompliances, poor maintenance, poor engineering practices, and equipment reliability problems, unquote. We have seen a nuclear reactor where workers have a lack of training, they're short-staffed, and there's a lack of resources. And this all points to systemic mismanagement and energy not putting any money into this dying reactor. And that's a threat to us all. It's a stunning report. Do you have any idea how it got to you? Was it that you were on an accidental CC list? Was a list picked up from somewhere else? Any clue at all about this? Well, the only people who received the email were all NRC.gov people and then me. So I don't think I'm that important that I would be on any pop-up email list in the NRC. <laughs> but we don't know. You know, if this release was intentional, then we have a real American hero on our hands. Where does it go from here? It's clear that the NRC has discovered gross problems within Pilgrim, and now it is documented. Well, you know, the NRC has determined that, quote, the plant seems overwhelmed just by trying to run the station. That's a serious accusation. It, this is very serious. They also said, too, quote, the corrective actions in the recovery plan seem to have been hastily developed and implemented, and some have been circumvented as they were deemed too hard to complete. We are observing current indications of a safety culture problem that a bunch of talking probably won't fix. Pilgrim needs to be shut down right now. They are identifying these systematic problems that threaten public safety. So we're looking for Governor Baker, Senator Markey, Senator Warren, and the whole congressional delegation to come out and make a statement that because public safety is threatened here, that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission must revoke the operating license now. They haven't done that yet. So we're hoping with this report, it's in black and white, that they will step up and do their job. How fast could that happen, and what can we do to help you create the pressure that will make that happen? Well, um, I think calling Governor Baker, Senator Markey Warren, and um, congressional representatives, they need to hear from the people, but also, too, they have a responsibility to read this report and do something. This is so glaringly alarming. It's evidence that Pilgrim should be shut down, and they need to act on this. Given this report, and if anybody reads it, we have a civic and moral obligation to be outraged. 
This reactor right now is threatening 5 million people who live in that 50-mile emergency planning zone. We're not talking about a candy factory here. We're talking about a nuclear power reactor, and this can no longer be ignored. So people need to step up and speak out. It's the time in our democratic society that action by the people is really going to make the change and nothing else. So we're asking folks to call Governor Baker, Senator Markey Warren, the whole Massachusetts delegation, to demand that they now make a statement, a public statement, that Pilgrim is a threat to the people of the Commonwealth and must be shut down now. You're going to give us some links and some phone numbers, which will be posted on the website. I'm not often speechless, but this comes as close as I've been in a long time because mm -hmm. the magnitude of what has been revealed is terrifying mm -hmm. because it sounds like even if they're doing their best there, it's nowhere near good enough and they're not equipped to take care of any kind of an emergency situation, that if anything, they're creating an emergency situation on their own just by being there and allowed to continue to operate. The fear being that with this being the Christmas season, the holiday season, that members of the Massachusetts legislature are all going to be home and hoping that this blows over rather than seizing the opportunity to give a real gift to the people of the Commonwealth and really the people on Earth and shutting this thing down before something truly catastrophic happens there. So well said, so well said. It would be a gift to all of us to have Pilgrim shut down immediately. We recognize now that the NRC can't save us and that our representative needs to act on that. I have to just share that one Plymouth resident actually said that this email may well save our lives. Here's hoping that that's true and that the save comes in sooner rather than later. It's clear that this is nothing that will be corrected by itself. It is nothing that will be created by the company. And the only thing that needs to happen now is for it to be shut down, and then you shift into dealing with the waste issues. But at least no more new waste will be created, and that nuclear reaction will not be there to create a more catastrophic problem. Absolutely. Right now, we need to mobilize for survival and step up and speak out. That's a good slogan. I hope you use it as a hashtag, mobilize for survival. Okay, we will. We will. Diane Turco, thanks so much for calling back in time to get on this week's Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for addressing this very most serious and current issue. Diane Turco of Cape Downwinders and a woman of extraordinarily fine karma. We will have the websites, email contacts, and phone numbers that Diane spoke of available to you for your use to increase pressure on Massachusetts government officials to shut Pilgrim now. All of this information will be up on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 286. And we'll also have a link so that you can read that complete NRC email. It is quite the document. By the way, Dave Lockbaum of the Union of Concerned Scientists figured out how this email probably got to Diane. That's because there's a woman at the NRC in PR whose first name is also Diane and whose last name begins with an S who was likely the planned recipient of the information. So this whole story came about because of a slip of the thumb or divine intervention by the great karmic fart. Either way, what a blessing. In other news... As we reported in last week's Nuclear Hot Seat number 285, the state of Illinois has passed the Exelon Nuclear Bailout Bill, which ensures continued nuclear risks and radioactive waste generation in that state. Governor Bruce Rauner has signed it into law and is ensuring that over the next 10 years, a legislatively mandated $2.35 billion rate hike will take effect and there will be production of nearly 900 tons of additional high-level radioactive wastes and the other risks that nuclear power poses for Illinois. As David Kraft, director of Chicago-based Nuclear Energy Information Service, quipped, what a terrific Christmas gift for the children and future of Illinois. 
More details are now available on the ceiling collapse that took place at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. The country's only approved repository for plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste. The accident, which took place on November 3rd, had a massive area of the ceiling fall down. A rock fall two-thirds the length of a football field and eight feet thick. Fortunately, the area had been shut down because of two previous and smaller ceiling falls, and no one was injured. This continues to call into question the facility's ability to handle ground control in a contaminated mine. Sorry, Energy Secretary Moni Moniz, but your little duplicitous statement that WIP was going to be back in operation by the end of December of this year mm, doesn't look like it. Don Hancock, a longtime WIP watchdog at Albuquerque's Southwest Research and Information Center and a regular source of information here on Nuclear Hot Seat, said, DOE should take its time because it is a safety issue. It is a radioactively contaminated mine without adequate ventilation, and in addition, they are having roof fall problems in the exact rooms. They say they want to put the waste in. And now for the nuclear reactor duck <laughs> and cover report based on the reports that go directly to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. At Peach Bottom in Pennsylvania on December 8th, The Unit 2 high-pressure core injection system failed to meet surveillance testing requirements for achieving rating flow, and operations declared the system inoperable. The condition is being reported as one that could have prevented the fulfillment of the safety function of a system required to mitigate the consequences of a design event. That's a really big accident. (laughs) At Nine Mile Point in New York on December 10th, The manual reactor scram due to high-maintenance turbine vibrations led to a hot shutdown. (coughs) At Vogel in Georgia on December 9th, a nuclear service cooling water transfer pump tripped during testing, with required action to be hot standby in six hours and hot shutdown in 12 hours. Yet another good reason for all of us to duck (coughs) and cover. Energy Corporation has announced that the Palisades Nuclear Power Plant in Michigan will close in 2018. The reactor on the shores of Lake Michigan, only 70 miles away from Chicago, will be shut down for business reasons. Energy plans to refuel Palisades as scheduled in the spring of 2017 and operate through the end of the fuel cycle, then permanently shut down as of October 1, 2018. Two days after my birthday. Hallelujah. Here's hoping nothing goes wrong before then. This next story may be old news to some, but now it's verifiable. Cesium-134, the fingerprint of Fukushima, has been measured in seawater samples taken from Tillamook Bay and Gold Beach in Oregon, according to researchers from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Because of its relatively short half-life, Cesium-134 can only have come from Fukushima. And for the first time, Cesium-134 has also been officially detected in Canadian salmon. This according to the Fukushima INFORM project, led by University of Victoria chemical oceanographer Jay Cullen. To put that information in perspective, here's a note I picked up on social media from Heidi Hutner, director of the Sustainability Study Program at Stony Brook University. She wrote, Remember, folks, you only detect something if you are testing for it. To my knowledge, only one official scientific group is currently testing for radiation from Japan in the oceans, the Woods Hole crowd-funded research, and not extensively. The Japanese government has repressed findings. As a friend writes to me, The Japanese Secrecy Act can be used to hide information, and there's a concerted effort to stop people from revealing medical information. Doctors and nurses have been warned not to report their findings related to radiation exposure, and media professionals have been threatened and fired. So we really don't know the full extent of what's happened to the Pacific Ocean as a result of Fukushima. 
Despite the many emails that I have gotten urging me to one side or another, it is now clear that Donald Trump is not neutral or on the fence when it comes to nuclear. In a document obtained by Bloomberg, Trump's transition team asked the Energy Department how it can help keep nuclear reactors, quote, operating as part of the nation's infrastructure, end quote, and what it could do to prevent the shutdown of plants. Meanwhile, the Plowshares Fund has a new report out, 10 Big Nuclear Ideas for the Next President. We'll have a link to it up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. Internationally speaking, China has flown a nuclear bomber over South China Sea as a message to Donald Trump. And no, we're not talking about skywriting. China flew a nuclear-capable bomber outside of its borders in a show of force less than a week before Trump's phone call with the president of Taiwan. The H-6 bomber has been used by China to drop nuclear devices in tests. Just a little wake-up call. Some good news. The United Nations has agreed to an Irish charity's call to designate April 26 as UN International Chernobyl Day. It is meant to be a lasting reminder of the world's worst nuclear accident until Fukushima with Chernobyl having happened on April 26, 1986. The announcement was hailed by Chernobyl charity crusader Adi Roche, who made the suggestion during her address to the U.N. General Assembly earlier this year to mark the 30th anniversary of the accident. Her call was backed by the Belarusian government and subsequently by 30 other countries. The move was finally sanctioned by the U.N. this week. Thank you, Adi. And one of the activities of the group that she founded, Chernobyl Children International, is the Rest and Recuperation Program, which gives children who come from impoverished backgrounds and state-run institutions a health-boosting reprieve from the toxic environment and high levels of radiation to which they are exposed. The contamination is worse this year because forest fires called excess contamination for the kids through the smoke that re-released radionuclides into the environment, thus rendering recontamination perpetual. And from Japan, this trickily worded article from Asahi Shimbun. They say that radiation in all seafood caught off Fukushima Prefecture, quote, tested below the detectable level in November for the first time since the 2011 nuclear disaster. The prefectural government said that all samples fell below the detection threshold. But where was that detection level set? No answer to that. It also says the tests since April of last year show that the pollution in all samples was, quote, within the safety limit. But that's an artificially set number. Or, as Professor Chris Busby says, below detectable level is one statement, the other is below safety limit. These are not the same. We'll have today's featured interview in just a moment. But first, ho, ho, ho. Happy Hanukkah to Kwanzaa Solstice Ramamas! If you've been wondering where to send your holiday end-of-year donation, please think of Nuclear Hot Seat, your premier source for verifiable nuclear news. We rely on your donations to keep bringing you the information you won't hear anywhere else. We are up and running every week, 52 weeks a year. And trust me, we could not do it without your support. So please... Help us keep getting the information out that allows you to know what's really going on in the nuclear world. Consider it your holiday gift towards a nuclear-free future. Guaranteed good karma points. Anything you can contribute, we would welcome. No donation is too small. And, of course, you always have the option of making a small monthly donation, what I call the Starbucks donation of buying a cup of coffee, by setting it up as a recurring payment. We are grateful for anything you can contribute, so please do what you can today. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. Know that anything you can do to support us helps us all get to what is hopefully going to be a nuclear-free future. The Rocky Flats plant 
was a former nuclear weapons production facility in Colorado, near both Boulder and Denver. It operated from 1952 to 1992 and left behind a toxic radioactive legacy made worse by numerous fires at the site which dispersed plutonium and other deadly radionuclides in the smoke and ash. Declared a Superfund site, the cleanup has been long and controversial, as the U.S. Department of Energy, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment have all concluded that the cleanup has been effective. The government even turned it into a wildlife refuge. But there have long been stories of illnesses, cancers, mutations, problems of all kinds in those who lived near and worked in the facility. And none of that showed up in these assessments by the government agencies. A new health study, begun in May 2016, has just released preliminary results. And they are stunning. To find out more, I spoke with Kristen Iverson. She is author of the acclaimed book, Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. We've previously interviewed Kristen about Rocky Flats on Nuclear Hot Seat number 222, which aired on September 22nd of 2015. Here, she gives us the lowdown on this recent health study and what its preliminary findings indicate as well as how we can respond in a way that helps those impacted by the radioactive releases. Kristen Iverson, thank you so much for joining us today on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell us about the Rocky Flats Health Survey. What is it, and how long has this assessment been going on? This is really a very new thing that has just happened, although it is long, long overdue. The way it, it started really was when my book first came out, I uh, was inundated with emails from people who are sick. And, of course, in my neighborhood where I grew up near Rocky Flats and when I was working at Rocky Flats, we always heard lots of stories. Um, my sisters and I grew up with the idea that cancer was just very commonplace. There was cancer in almost every home in our neighborhood. But when my book came out, all the stories and emails that I had gotten slowly over the years, all of a sudden there was just a deluge of hundreds, thousands of stories. And uh, so every time that I would do a presentation or speak at a university or something, I would say, we need to have more studies. There has never been an epidemiological study of people who live around Rocky Flats. There are a lot of sick people, a lot of sick animals and pets and we need a new study, we need an independent study. So last spring, Carol Jensen with Metropolitan State University and others at, at uh, Colorado State University and uh, other interested parties, including the Rocky Flats Downwinders, they initiated a new health study of people who live in areas around Rocky Flats or have lived in areas around Rocky Flats. So that study began as an online study. Thousands of people responded to that. And just about uh, three weeks ago, we got the preliminary results of that study, and they were pretty stunning. And we did a couple of community meetings and a press conference in Denver. And then I recently spoke in Washington, D.C. about the preliminary results of this new health study, which indeed contradicts what the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has found in the past. Tell us a bit about what they say has been found in the past and what has turned up as a result of these preliminary results of the study. Well, the preliminary results are, are in fact, pretty stunning. Let me back up a little bit and say there have been studies in the past that have shown a higher incidence of cancers and, and other radiation-related illnesses around Rocky Flats, particularly beginning with Dr. Carl Johnson, who was uh, director of the Jefferson County Health Department for a period of time. And some of those studies have indeed been validated, but they're always countered by studies funded by the Department of Energy or Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And those studies would say, mm -mm, you know, there's not really a danger here. There's no reason to be concerned. Any cancer that we see in the area is um, relative to other cancers that we see in Colorado. Well, this new health study shows that that is not the case. This new study has found significantly higher levels 
of cancers and other illnesses that tend to be related to radiation. And the most specific things that the study found was a much higher rate of thyroid cancer and a much higher rate of rare cancers and disorders, including blood disorders, that tend to be related to radioactive contamination. Um, and of course, we had other types of contamination out there as well, a, a great deal of carbon tetrachloride and other VOCs and things like that. So some of those illnesses, you know, they're not all of them necessarily tied to plutonium in particular, but certainly plutonium is the most dangerous thing that we have been exposed to. That was one of the things that struck me, this extremely long list of the so-called rare cancers, which constituted more than 48% of the total number of cancers reported. And I don't know about you, but every time I hear the phrase rare cancer, I think, okay, where's the source of nuclear radiation, ionizing radiation? Has any kind of a pattern been found in the results? Is there any kind of footprint or indication of the impact of the radiation in the local community? Well, I think one of the more interesting things that the study has found thus far, and of course let me preface this by saying that uh, these are preliminary results only and we'll have to wait for the final results um, to see what's really there, but the study shows patterns of illness in rings around the plant as, um, you know, as I think we kind of anticipated, you know, five mile, 10 mile, 20 mile kind of radius. But what it's showing that I don't think anyone really anticipated is that the patterns of illness tend to follow the pattern of the plumes from the 1957 and the 1969 fires. Now, of course, there were many fires at Rocky Flats, more than 200 fires over the course of 38 years, but those two fires were the biggest, and they were so big, they, uh, the measuring equipment and the filtering equipment both were burned out, so we will never know exactly how much contamination spread over the Metro Denver area from those two fires. Um, but we do know the plume, and that plume is mapped quite clearly based on Department of Energy information. And uh, what we're seeing thus far is that patterns of illness tend to follow the pattern of that particular plume. What does that speak to in terms of relevance of this report? Does it reveal something that we need to understand about the way these plumes and the contamination run? Well, I think for one thing, it certainly demonstrates the fact that, that this type of contamination cannot be contained. It can't be contained on site. It can't be contained uh, within particular areas. You know, once it's out, it's out. And this is, of course, in Colorado, it's all dependent upon the, the wind patterns and how the winds come down off those mountains, the Chinook winds in particular, and move across that land and take all of that contamination over Arvada in related areas near, you know, where I grew up in those areas, but then on over the Metro Denver area and then onto the state border, you know, um, it doesn't stop at the, at the state border, it goes on from there. It's quite a dramatic, it's a very dramatic map of contamination. You know, one thing that points to is, is the need to take a close look in terms of health effects, not just at neighborhoods within 5, 10, 20, 30 miles of Rocky Flats. Certainly that 10 mile radius is pretty significant. But on over the Metro Denver area, we see the plume um, extending in a very specific way. We also saw some interesting things up around Broomfield. And at this point it's only uh, speculation, of course, but that might be tied to some of the problems they had with Great Western Reservoir, which was eventually closed due to contamination from plutonium and also tritium. And there have been some um, ongoing concerns in that area as well. And, and so there are little clusters of illness up around Broomfield, which is up north of where we see most of the other illnesses. How has this information been received? by the local community and hopefully by those in government who have some power to do something about it. In Colorado, on the local level, reception has been mixed, I would say, and I certainly understand the great diversity of feelings that people might have about a study like this. Of course, there is great concern and worry from people who live in the area, who have children. Let me emphasize that many of the illnesses and health effects that we're seeing are not just from people in their 60s or their 50s or their 40s or people who were you know, living in the area when the plant was in operation. 
but we see illnesses from people in their in their 20s and their 30s and children there's a lot of new home development around rocky flats and of course many of those families are young families and they move into the into the area and they have uh, no idea what's happened or why they should be concerned but we're seeing illnesses there so i think in colorado people are concerned people are scared people are worried that they have not been informed fully informed certainly about the risk of living in the area and then we also have people are feeling um, very much in a kind of a catch 22 with the fact that there's all this new housing development new families are moving in they've invested i've heard from so many people who've moved into the area they invest their life savings into a house they don't realize that there's any risk associated with it and they're afraid to speak up people are worried about home values some people and so that gets into the mix as well there's so much pressure out there for home development and business development and a push to um, just forget that rocky flats ever happened pretend that there is no risk and that's certainly where the developers and to a certain extent government agencies would like us to go in that direction so the results were met in Colorado with some concern and some controversy and then recently when I spoke in Washington DC and shared these results and talked to people there there was a kind of well of course um I think people outside of Colorado on a national and even international level understand more fully what happened at Rocky Flats what happened with the environment and the ongoing health legacy and why we need to be concerned I think this is going to be an important study it may lead us to a direct correlation between radioactive contamination and very specific health effects there's a deep parallel for me between what is happening with rocky flats which are the effects of contamination that goes back to when did it start there was that the early 50s i think about 1952 1952 right mhm and what the people of north st louis are going through with their contamination that they've been dealing with since 1942 and the inappropriate dispersal of the radioactive materials there that it seems that the further away we get from the initiating contamination and exposure the more intense the health effects are and that it almost could be plotted along a chart between what's happened there since 1942 what's happened in rocky flats since 1952 has there been any attempt to coordinate the responses that people have been giving on their health between the various communities that have experienced exposure one of the most important grassroots organization to emerge in the last couple of years is rocky flats down winders there have been many organizations concerned about health effects of rocky flats and what's happening in the environment and ongoing leaks at the plant and all of that and they include the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center Candelas Glows which is an organization concerned about the new home development out there a very other really terrific organizations but i think the first organization to kind of really bring all of these diverse groups together is Rocky Flats Down Winders and certainly they have been a big part of this new study in making sure that information gets out to the public what is the next step for this study these are preliminary findings what else is being put in the mix before there's some final destination for the study well it's interesting once this information reached the news uh, the newspaper and local television stations and that sort of thing um the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment responded with a letter to all of us at Rocky Flats Down Winders and said that they would indeed recognize that there was some concern and they intended to do a study of their own although we didn't receive very many details about that it turns out that uh, the study that they intend to do is quite limited in scope they would like to have access to all of the information that the new health study has thus far and i'm not sure what's going to happen with this i know that rocky flats down winders has responded with a letter requesting that if the cdphe does a new study 
that they broaden the parameters, that they look at people who have lived in the area going all the way back to the 1960s and as much as that is possible to the present day and broaden the geographic area that they're going to study. However, I think it's also important, certainly my own personal feeling, is that it's very important to have an independent study. If CDPHE and DOE do a new study, that's terrific and very much needed. I think it's also necessary that we continue with an independent study organized and operated or managed by universities in the area with scientists who are independent from the Department of Energy and the Colorado Department of Public Health Environment. We're also looking at new independent soil studies in neighborhoods around the plant and really excited about that. And again, I think it's very important to have independent studies. It's great if CDPHE and DOE wants to do more studies. They're absolutely needed. And we need independent studies as well. So that's my hope that we continue to move forward in these two areas. And what I really hope to see is continued and further truth and transparency with respect to what happened at Rocky Flats and what is happening now. There's so much home development. They just broke down for a new elementary school out there. There are no signs. There is very little information for people who want to move into the area, and it's a beautiful area. It's a great place, you know, to grow up near Denver, near Boulder. The location is spectacular. People move into the area thinking that they're moving into a beautiful area, a great place to raise kids, and then they find out after they've signed the contract on the house that there may be some risk and perhaps significant risk associated with living out there and certainly with raising children. And there's no law that mandates that realtors in showing property disclose what potential risks there may be on the property? There is nothing specific that requires them to disclose what happened. Just three weeks ago, another writer, professor, friend of mine, we went out together out to the site and we toured some of the new home developments, frankly, just to see what real estate agents were telling people. And it was very interesting. And what we were told was that, and this was only when we asked about it, we were told that there were new trails, new schools. It was going to open as a national wildlife refuge. And wouldn't that be terrific? Deer and, you know, all that sort of thing, trails, hiking, great for kids and all that. When we pressed the real estate agent about what might have happened there and, and would she be willing to tell us, we were told that there was a facility there, but it had been all cleaned up, and Rocky Flats was the most successful environmental cleanup in the country, in the history of the United States. That's what we were told, and that it was entirely safe. There was nothing to worry about. And your assessment of that statement? I think it's untrue. I think there are a lot of listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat who would agree with you. As regards that national preserve, would you be willing to take a hike through there without hazmat equipment of any kind on you? I wouldn't go on that land. Um, we felt some trepidation tromping through the neighborhoods and looking at the new houses, which is directly adjacent to the site. And I suppose one thing that I keep in mind, there's a little bit of gallows humor here, given the fact that I worked at Rocky Flats and I grew up next to Rocky Flats. And, and the joke in my family has always been, well, uh, Rocky Flats is why we all have such glowing personalities. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, you know, we didn't know. And then the best that we can do now, and we've all had health issues, the best we can do now is just, you know, watch and um, keep track of things and try to stay informed. And, and I keep my children informed and, and we get our checkups and all of that. Um, would I hike on the site? Absolutely not. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of workers local residents, um, lawyers, attorneys, scientists, so many people have said the same thing. It's not worth the risk. And it, it's a very sad situation. It's beautiful land. But I think the, I think what must happen now is we've got to keep it closed. We've got to keep it closed and we've got to have more studies. And studies over time, as you said, none of this happens immediately. The cancers and the illnesses that we're seeing take time and they are passed on to generations or generational. And, of course, some exposures continuing with the ongoing leaks and problems that they're having at the site currently. Anything else you would like to add at this time? 
I'd just like to add that I'm just very grateful for all of the people who are working in this area in Colorado and on a national level as well. It's a really difficult subject. Many of the people involved have they worked at Rocky Flats. They've grown up in the area. They've seen the kinds of illnesses, you know, in their own families or for themselves. And, and so I'm just very grateful for their dedication and their ongoing efforts. It's a long journey working in this area. Well, I'm very grateful to you for taking time out of what sounded like an excruciatingly busy schedule to <laughs> speak with me this morning and make yourself available to the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks so much, Libby. Thank you for having me. Author Kristen Iverson. We'll have a link to the Rocky Flats Health Survey up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 286. We'll also have a link to Kristen's website so that you can see more about her book. And if you haven't read it already, it is a terrific read. And now... Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, none that's out of week. O-M-G. Real estate agents. Where is your sense of ethics, your morality, your humanity? Did you hear it in Kristen's interview? Realtors selling homes built on the edge of Rocky Flats, not only not telling potential home buyers about the radioactive legacy just across the street, but when questioned, claiming that it was, quote, the most successful environmental cleanup in the country in the history of the United States. What a talking point. What a spin. I'm dizzy just thinking about it. But it's not just in Colorado. Three weeks ago, on Nuclear Hot Seat number 283, I interviewed Robin Ellison Daly, who lives in a house with her husband less than half a mile from the illegally buried radioactive World War II nuclear weapons waste in the West Lake landfill. Robin reported that independent tests showed that dust taken from behind her refrigerator registered at 1,000 times background radiation and carried a signature identical to that of the waste in the West Lake landfill. And then she also told us that a real estate agent had just sold a house on her block to a young couple who hadn't a clue what they were getting into. And here in the Los Angeles area, where real estate agents are required by law to disclose any known defects with a property, none of the real estate agents I know who represent homes in the Simi Valley will mention the partial meltdown that took place in 1957 at the Santa Susana Field Lab and left the area contaminated with radiation, or the radioactive radon that poured out of the Porter Ranch gas leak for five months in early 2016. This is unconscionable. Does the National Association of Realtors make up these talking points and force you to memorize them before you're allowed to receive your license? Do they sanction this kind of lying by omission? Is it your office policy? Or are you just swallowing party line and not bothering to do your own research, saying, well, the government says it's okay, so I guess it's okay. Whatever the case. Until and unless this demonic abuse of the trust of innocent home buyers stops and you tell the truth about radiological contamination in and around the properties you are selling, real estate agents, realtors, your offices, your national organization, all of you are this week's nuclear hot seed, none that's out of the week. Thought I forgot about it, didn't you? <laughs> Activist shout out. Congratulations to Hervé Courtois, aka De Un Renard, on closing in on 2 million views of nuclear news.net, a reliable source for information on all aspects of the nuclear issue, especially those coming from Japan. I know Hervé does not do this alone, and my apologies, I don't have the other names in front of me right now, but when I get them, I will fill them in. There's a call out by Just Moms STL, Humans of Westlake Landfill, in alliance with the Franciscan Sisters of Mary, 
for a national candlelight prayer vigil for human and environmental justice. Areas of concern include, but are not limited to, Westlake Landfill, Coldwater Creek, Flint, Michigan, Standing Rock, and any of the issues in your area. They're calling for this on Thursday, December 22nd, 7 p.m. You can do that in your local time zone. Bring musical instruments, writings, art, drums, rattles, songs. Raise your voices in a joyful noise on behalf of life on the planet. Sounds like a deal to me, and it's right in conjunct with the solstice. And Bob Alvarez provided this charming anecdote about the late Senator John Glenn, the first astronaut to orbit the Earth, who later became a senator and died last week at the age of 94. Bob served for five years as one of the Senate's primary staff experts on the U.S. nuclear weapons program and also as a senior investigator for the U.S. Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs, which was chaired by Senator John Glenn. Bob said, I recall a Senate Armed Services Committee meeting where Senator Glenn showed me a drawing he made of a crocodile shedding a giant tear. Just after Senator Strom Thurmond, who was by this time incapable of coherent, spontaneous speech and could only read off three-by-five note cards fed by his staff, bemoaned the loss of beautiful hardwood trees on the Savannah River Nuclear Weapons Plant site in South Carolina. This happened because of construction of a cooling tower for one of the decrepit plutonium production reactors. Senator Glenn, soon after, played an instrumental role in shutting down all plutonium production at SRP for public safety reasons and started the cleanup of this profoundly contaminated site. It seems that they just don't make senators like they used to. Except for some. Here's today's final thought. Oh, what a twisted web is being woven. Fake news is showing up all over the place, and it's being used to muddy our understanding of any issue and anyone who stands for anything. I don't even know if it's focused any more than just being a great sport for people who can't do anything positive with their lives to mess with the world and smear it all over with garbage and confusion. This disinformation is starting to show up in the movement against nuclear in all of its many forms. This is more than just the usual spin and counter perspectives put forth by the nuclear industry mouthpieces like World Nuclear News, the IAEA, the United Nations UNSCEAR, and more. It's worse than the made-up gag-me-with-a-spoon faux quote-unquote science of insanities like hormesis or the Fukushima Daiichi ice wall. What we're talking about here is intentional, made-up, whole cloth, having nothing to do with reality posts that are starting to show up on social media to be passed on as news. And unfortunately, it's been catching some very smart activists by surprise. And they have failed to recognize the warning signs before passing it along. Just two examples from the past week. A report out of China that hit me from a couple of directions that, since Fukushima, Japan doctors have identified two new blood types. Besides the fact that it sounds biologically impossible, a quick check showed that the story was a mere two paragraphs, both of them skimpy, no source material, no links, no specifics, not even very good English. <coughs> That's one big red flag. Another is to check the source by putting the website into Google and adding the words fake to your search term. In this case, the site, which was based in China, came up immediately flagged as fake. So I went back to the Facebook page, posted the information that it was a fake story so others could see, and then deleted it from my page. I don't believe in passing along fake I don't even want to call it news, fake junk, in order to point out to people that it's fake, when many will just see that I posted it and, quite understandably, believe that I'm endorsing it or saying that it's real, when in truth it's not. The other story was more insidious, and this one got me going for a while until I ran it down. It seemed to be announcing 
that Canada had just approved Ontario Power Generation's high-level radioactive waste repository to be built one mile from the shore of Lake Huron, meaning one mile from the shore of all the Great Lakes. I'll admit that I saw red. I was furious when I read this until it hit me that it was posted on a Sunday night and said that a panel had approved it. I know that this particular decision will take more than a panel to approve. And besides, official government panels do not meet on a Sunday, let alone release a major news story at that time. Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock, yes. Sunday at any time, no. So I did another Google search using the term OPG Nuclear Waste Dump Approved. And lo and behold, the first two articles that came up were from Stop the Great Lakes Nuclear Dump, informational articles. If this story were true, it would be all over that first page. So there was no corroboration. False story. Again, I wrote a note on it not being true and then deleted it from my page. I tell you this so that you'll be careful out there. Some really good people were fooled, and I was even fooled to begin with. Realize that if a story is outrageous, too good or too bad to be true, make certain you check it out before you hit that share button. It will only take a minute, two at the very most, and you'll save yourself a lot of grief and not give comfort to our enemies. That's why, when I tell you about nuclear hot seat, that I utilize information only from verifiable sources, this is the kind of work I do on stories one after another after another. It's really easy to get derailed by flashy headlines, be they wish fulfillment or nightmare inducing. I check as best I can online, and if I'm still not sure, I make a quick call, send a text, or shoot an email to someone I know can steer me right. So please, if it looks too good or too bad to be true, do yourself a favor and look a little deeper before you click that share button. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, December 13, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from CapeCodTimes.com and the superb journalism of Christine Legere, NEIS.org, ABQJournal.com, MLive.com, USA Today, CBSNews.com, Bloomberg.com, Plowshares.org, EENews.net, Asahi.com, JapanTimes.com, Mainichi.com, TheDailyBeast.com, Independent.co.uk, Mining.com, ChinaPost.com, Chernobyl Children's International.org, IrishExaminer.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, thanks to the work of Erica Gray, Sean Arklight for his superb advice on European based issues, and the Resolute Planet Protectors who gather at the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook, which you are all invited to come to so you can join us, like us, really like us. And share our posts with your friends and family. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. If you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. A reminder that if you appreciate weekly verifiable news updates about nuclear issues around the world, delivered with as much humor as possible, take a moment in honor of the holidays, or any reason at all, and send a supporting donation to NuclearHotSeat.com. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is downloaded in 112 countries. People are listening and the activists are linking. So let's get to work and not go back to sleep because we are all in the Nuclear Hot Seat. 
nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.